we have a premier class journalist with us here, um, someone who has borne witness to countless wars, too many conflicts over more than two decades. She's seen the world. Uh, there's a long list of countries that uh, she has been in, um, and not the best of it necessarily, um, in the Balkans, in the Middle East, in Africa. And one could say a lot, we'll meet her in just a moment, but I, I think it's fair to say that this is a journalist who has a capacity to convey the stories of human suffering with a clarity and in a, in a way that somehow manages to be both understated and, and unnervingly vivid. Um, she is a rare breed among journalists. Uh, she hasn't just accidentally found herself in the epicenter of these wars, much like you heard of Peter Sturzberg, send me there. She says she's compelled to go to places um, that are suffering in humanitarian crisis or conflict. And she has mined these experiences to create a body of work that is powerful, that is urgent, uh, it's anguished, um, as a journalist, as an author, as a professor of human rights, it is also a level of dedication um, that she has written about in her own memoir that has been corrosive for her. Um, I have to say I didn't see any of that in the few moments. So we were just <laughs> met in the green room, as they say, really warm and uh, engaging and managed to get a lot of information out of everyone in the room. So uh, all, really good characteristics for a journalist. and. Uh, no doubt in your travels and meeting people and bearing witness to their lives. There's a long list of distinguished credentials. Um, maybe I'll mention a few more. Uh, senior fellow at Yale University's Jackson Institute of Global Affairs, uh, teaching a professor at Columbia University, many awards, uh, author of several books, including the memoir that I mentioned. So we're gonna hear from Janine Di Giovanni in a few moments and have an opportunity to ask her questions. Um, but first, I'd like to just invite you to take a look at this excerpt from a documentary, Seven Days in Syria, featuring her work. You'll see her in the field. <laughs> If you want people to trust you, and if you really want to get inside their world, you can't be a journalist who's an observer. Hey. The thing about being in war zones, especially active war zones, is that the unexpected always happening. What we're going to try to do is embed ourselves with people, how they're trying to attempt to hold their lives together. I think we should head home now. Yeah, let's head home. The heroes of Aleppo aren't the fighters, it's the people that are holding this city together. People who are feeding it and providing medical supplies. <laughs> We have to go now. It's kind of dangerous. We have to be very sensitive with what we're asking them to protect them and their families. Mahmoud, 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 Afrania, Mahmoud. In a day, does he get many children that are, that are killed? There's an airplane. Had it. surrounded by a mob making the sign, um, cutting the throat. We all need to be aware of the fragility of life. And in some places, it's just much more fragile. Please welcome Janine Di Giovanni. Uh, even now, that film makes me very emotional. Um, I'm so honored to be here. Every time I get to come to Canada, I feel very happy and very envious 
that you're Canadian because in a sense for me, Canada embodies all the things that an American, which I am, that we strive to be. <clears throat> to me, you really honor the democratic institutions, the rights of the individual, standing up for freedom of expression, rule of law, and human rights. And those are all the reasons I became a journalist, and those are the reasons why I am still a journalist. I want to start off by just showing you very briefly um, a few of the photographs from Syria, and some of them are from Iraq <clears throat> during the war with the Islamic State, just to give you an idea of what I'm going to talk to you about and what I do. They were taken by my colleague, Nicole Tung, who is also in the film with me. Um, you can, by the way, you can get that film on iTunes or Google Play. It's, it's available or Amazon. Um, but just so you see what it looks like to live in a war zone. I hope I could do this. <laughs> okay. This is Aleppo. <clears throat> These are all inside Syria or in Iraq during the fighting. I spent this week listening to Peter Sturberg's reports from 1945. One thing that struck me aside from the fact that the bombing that he was reporting from Italy sounded so, bombing is bombing wherever you go. But it was also his ability, his attention to detail. The way that he could really make a story, the people, the situation, what it smelt like, what it felt like, how hungry people were, make that come alive. And I think in many ways, that's what I've always tried to do. He was an oral historian. And I've always rather grandly felt that what I tried to do was to be more of an anthropologist, um, to go to places to try to embed with local people. I'm not really good at embedding in the traditional American or Canadian sense of embedding with soldiers. It's not my thing. I like to go somewhere and really get into the lives of people and how they live. Um, I just wanted to very quickly, because how could I not mention the, the elections yesterday in the US? Um, I've lived overseas my entire life, and I'm a first generation Italian immigrant. My dad came from Napoli. And um, I left at a very early age to live overseas so that I could report wars and that I'd be closer to the Balkans and Africa and the Middle East. And this year I came back to the US after 30 years. Um, it's terrifying for me to be in a country that I see so many characteristics of wars I've reported or the beginning of wars happening in a so-called democratic country. The suppression of the free press, the broken rule of law, and the, the, the diminishing human rights, all of the pillars of democracy not to mention a president who is inciting hate rhetoric, things that I heard in places like Rwanda or Bosnia. So it, it means more than ever, journalism is so important, not just in the US, worldwide, because it's something that is happening everywhere, the rise of populism, the rise of hate rhetoric. And it's why we really have to preserve this incredibly important thing we have, which is called journalism. Our job, whether you're working in Ottawa, whether you're working in Montreal, whether you're working as a war reporter, is to tell the truth and to shine a light in dark places, to give a voice to people that don't have a voice. It's to expose injustice, to seek answers from those in power, and to always speak truth to power. 
to question authority. That's why I entered this business, and that's the way I want to end my days, is questioning authority. President Trump calls us fake news and enemies of the people. I'm really proud when he says that. I mean, we're so not fake news, and I'm not an enemy of the people, but um, it only makes me and my colleagues want to do our job even better, even more correctly, and to get the message out. The thing that's really interesting for me is I've lived in so many countries where freedom of speech doesn't exist, where you would get imprisoned, killed, um, or in the case of Jamal Khashoggi, assassinated in a foreign country simply for telling the truth. So it's interesting to me now that the thing that is most under attack is freedom of expression. And I, I had a conversation with a political scientist a few days ago, and I said to her, you know, what? What can we do to strengthen um, the public's attitude towards journalists? What could we do to keep it alive, this truth-telling, storytelling, keeping the narrative? And she said to me, it's really interesting, first of all, we need to continue education, which is why Carleton is so important to train journalists, but also we need to change the cultural norm of how we see journalists. She said, we need to thank them for their service, she wrote to me. When we see an active member of the military, we thank them for their service. We should do the same for reporters. So it's a perception about how we see them. Now, the job I've done for 30 years, I'm afraid to say, is a whole different thing. Um, witnessing the extreme suffering of others and trying to relay the sorrow, the pain, to a wide public it is a very heavy burden to shoulder, and there's a lot of consequences. I've just been asked this past week several times to be on a panel, a film about a friend of mine, a colleague, Marie Colvin, an American reporter who was killed in Syria in 2012, just came out, called The Private War. It's a big Hollywood film, and it kind of glamorizes what war is really like, but nonetheless, it's about a, an incredibly brave woman who is driven to live a life in extremists, to report the truth. Um, and it really made me question, why, why do we do this? You know, why do we follow wars with such obsessions? Why did I feel compelled, as Susan or Rita said? It was a real, for me, and is a real compulsion um, to tell these stories. And it started a long time ago, which I'll tell you about. But first, I want to tell you something very, very personal. Um, that actually happened to me yesterday. I had to go, I have a 14-year-old son um, who is the great love of my life. He's called Luca. Um, he was born after the fall of Saddam Hussein, which is kind of, in my strange way of living, the way I divide up my life. Well, that happened during Bosnia, that happened during Rwanda, that happened during Sierra Leone. He was conceived in Africa, and he was born right after the fall of, of Saddam Hussein. And... Um, oh no, that, it probably is him. Could you please turn it off? <laughs> oh no, I'm so sorry. I didn't think there was a signal in here. Anyway, um, I had to go. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> and it has to be him. <laughs> you can just pull everything out. It's him. Um, no. <laughs> well, that's, you know, a mother's life. Um, so I went to this parent-teacher conference, and um, the teacher said to me, you know, he's a very nice boy. He's very polite. He's doing well. He's, he's, my son is French, and it's the first time ever. We, I, we moved to New York in September. It's the first time he's in an English-language school. So I was very nervous that he was, his language skills weren't going to be. But she said, but you know, I have to tell you something, and it's a bit disturbing. And I thought, oh, God, what is it? And she said, I asked the boys to list their biggest fears. Um, what is their fear? And, you know, most of the boys said things like, um, I'm worried about talking to girls, or I'm worried about I'm not going to earn enough money when I grow up, or I'm wor worried about I won't get into college. But Luca wrote, I'm afraid my mother is going to get her head chopped off by a sword in Iraq. Well, I, you know, at first I, I thought, 
this is a joke. And then I realized it wasn't, that it was to him his reality. And then I was flooded with all the terrible things that, you know, every mother, every father in the world has guilt and, and um, all kinds of, you know, what have I done wrong? What could I have done better? But I realized that um, his experience of, of having a mother was me leaving to go to wars and him not knowing if he'd see me again. And one of the things about being a war reporter is you never think anything will happen to you, unless you're really, really crazy and you're someone that enjoys adrenaline and getting shot at, but I never knew anyone like that. You always go into it thinking, nothing's going to happen to me. I'm, I'm, I'm not invincible, but my mother loves me too much, or nothing will happen. Um, but the fact is, and the reality, that his reality could be closer to the truth because we live in times when Jamal Khashoggi was chopped into a million little pieces by the crown prince of Saudi Arabia or his henchmen. Um, so giving you that very private story, I'm gonna now tell you how I got into this work, um, especially for students who might be here tonight who think I wanna be a war reporter. Um, the, the truth is that I didn't choose it I never set out thinking, I want to be a war reporter. Um, I didn't have a plan. And someone once said to me, it's almost as though this life chose you. And I think, in a sense, it did. I was living in London in the late 1980s, and I was a graduate student studying comparative literature. I wanted to be a writer, but I had no idea how to do that, how to put this together. Um, and one day, I picked up a newspaper, and there was an article with a photograph. It was really the photograph that captured me. And it was of a, a Palestinian teenager being buried alive by a, a bulldozer with some Israeli soldiers in it. And I thought, what is this? And I started reading the article. I lived in the world of Russian literature and Spanish literature. I, I really didn't pay attention to political affairs at all. So I started reading, and it was something called the First Intifada the first uprising, the Palestinian uprising in the late 80s in Israel-Palestine. And this article was about one woman who was called Felicia Langer, and she was a Holocaust survivor, Polish-Jewish, who had gone to Israel um, in the 1940s, studied law, and in 1967, after the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, began defending Palestinians in military court, even though she was Jewish, and even though at that point she was the only Israeli Jewish man or woman defending Palestinians. Um, so her life was basically hell. She was spat upon in the street. Her office got bombed all the time. She was hated, um, loathed, and she lost nearly all of her cases. But the strange thing was, she got up every single day, and she went to work, and she kept doing it. And I was so intrigued by her, because she believed more than anything in justice. She just believed that people had the right to legal representation, to justice, and that their stories needed to be told. Something happened to me, um, which I think happens to once in your lifetime, or maybe twice in your lifetime, where you, you have a choice. And it was almost as though I walked through a door and I could never go back again. And I flew to Israel. I wasn't a journalist. I, I lied about having an assignment. I met her, and my life was never the same again. She took me to the West Bank in Gaza. She introduced me to people. She brought me to my first refugee camp outside of Bethlehem called Dehesha. And I had lived in a world of libraries and books and suburban, growing up in the suburbs with you know, bicycles and vacations at the beach. And here were people who had been living for 40 years, 30 years at that point, in hellish conditions with no sanitation, with raids on their houses, with you know, dreams of a home that they once had that they would never have again, and with absolutely no rights. And she said to me, if you have the ability to tell the stories of these kind of people, then you have the obligation. 
And that was it. I went back to London. I did finish my degree in comparative literature, but I never used it. Um, right after that, I wrote a profile of her. And I was very lucky. It was read by an agent who said, can you write a book like this? And I was 26 years old. I didn't know how to write a book. But I said, yeah, I can. <laughs> so I went, I went back to Israel and Palestine. And I spent basically the next two or three years um, talking to people from all stretches of life. Israelis, Israeli soldiers, Israeli settlers, Palestinian activists, Palestinian radicals, potential suicide bombers, people who had been in prison, people who had been tortured. I lived in refugee camps for months. I, um, it really was a kind of my descent into something. Um, it really was embedding before embedding was invented as a term for reporting. And my life changed forever. And of course, it took a huge toll on my personal life as well, um, because I became obsessive, as, as you do when you begin to report these things. And the sense of injustice was so huge for me. My book came out, um, and right about that same time, the war in Bosnia broke out. And I went, I went there. And I lived in Sarajevo during the siege from 1992 to 1994, pretty steadily, and then the last year of the war, I went back and forth. Um, living inside a siege, a medieval siege, I don't know if any of you remember it, but you know, my students at Yale weren't born, in fact, they weren't born during 9-11, so it's, <laughs> it's hard to explain to them what happened in the Balkans, but the war in Bosnia, and it's why I'm so terrified every time President Trump says, I'm a nationalist, I just, Something inside of me cringes because when you say nationalism to me, I smell burning villages in central Bosnia and I see rows and rows of people stretching for miles being marched out of their homes, being deported. And I see people in Rwanda during the genocide and to me nationalism is a horrible word. It's not the same as patriotism, it's, it's a different thing. Um, and the war in Bosnia was characterized by extreme nationalism and by um, genocide. Genocide, the first genocide in Europe since World War II. Um, I, one of the courses I teach at Yale is about humanitarian intervention. And the, we study four conflicts, which are Bosnia, Kosovo, Rwanda, and Sierra Leone, all of which I've reported. But they're all linked by something which is about are they just wars? Is there such a thing as a just war? Is there a time when it is actually appropriate to go to defend a country? Um, now, we all know the mess that Iraq became. But in Bosnia, living in Sarajevo during the siege with, with the civilian Bosni Bosniak people who were being shelled beyond belief, shelled, sniped at, starved, um, Sarajevo was freezing cold. It had been the site of the 1984 Olympics, so you know you can imagine it was a really cold place. No electricity, no heating, no food, and the Serbs basically had a stranglehold on it. But that was my first real war. And Martha Gellhorn, who was Hemingway's third wife, and herself a wonderful war reporter, once said, you can only love one war. The rest is responsibility. And that was my great love, in a sense, Bosnia, because it taught me, it taught me so much. It taught me that as journalists, we're meant to be objective, but sometimes the truth isn't objective. And as much as I tried to try to see it from all sides, the fact was that I was living with civilian people who were being exterminated, and the world did nothing. And it was incredibly frustrating to be sitting with them when they would say, you know, when is the West going to come and save us? How can people watch us be exterminated like this? It was really painful. And what was more painful was that Srebrenica, the genocide that occurred at the very end of the war, where 8,000 men and boys were marched into the woods, hunted down like deer or prey, and murdered, and then worse, put in mass graves, separated mass graves. Their bodies, their bones were separated so that they could never be uh, traced to a war crimes tribunal. And to this day, 
there are still mothers who I speak to who are waiting for their son's bones to be, to be brought back to them. Um, so Srebrenica was a real turning point, and eventually the West did come. There were peacekeepers, but to me it was always too little, too late. In 1994, I went to Rwanda during the genocide. At this point, I was getting a bit burnt out. I had been in Sarajevo, Bosnia for two years, and um, my life basically consisted of hoarding water. That was my big thing. Water was like my... Even now, to this day, my son says to me, you know, Mom, <laughs> we're not in a war zone, but water to me is, if you don't have water, it's the one thing you need. So whenever I hear there's going to be a hurricane or something, I fill the bathtub, and um, I get a little crazy about that. Water and candles. Um, but R Rwanda was something else, because within three months, between April and August, one million people were murdered. And a lot of them were murdered by machete. Machete is really labor-intensive killing. It's not the control shot to the head. It's, it's a horrific way to die. A million people. And the worst part of it was, well, of course, you had a great um, Canadian peacekeeper, Romeo Dallaire, who was basically forced to leave to abandon these people. Um, and we were helpless as reporters seeing what was happening. And, you know, I'm a reporter. I'm not a soldier. I can't save lives. I do not carry a gun. I don't carry any kind of weapon. Um, and I remember in Rwanda seeing something which, you know, still sometimes it comes out in my dreams. Um, and it was piles of bodies. I mean, twice my height, which went on down a road which was miles and miles. It must have been four miles of bodies, and, and um, this was in, in uh, near the Great Lakes, and at that point the bodies were still kind of coming up in the river, and there were some wonderful Irish aid workers called Goal, and they did a job which no one wanted to do, which was they basically were collecting the bodies and trying to bury them. And then a horrific cholera epidemic broke out amongst the Hutus, who were, of course, the perpetrators of the, of the killing, the Tutsis, although there is a Canadian journalist now who has written a book um, which basically says it was not the Hutus, but the Tutsis who provoked it. So there's a kind of revisionist theory about what actually happened in Rwanda. But anyway, there was a cholera epidemic that broke out, and then people started dying at my feet. Like, literally, I'd be walking through a refugee camp with a... I had to wear a thing over my, um, over my face so that I didn't get the the germs, and they would fall at my feet and throw up and die. So when I was there for about a month, I realized that I stopped feeling things. And I knew that was a bad sign. Because if I, if I no longer felt the emotion that I feel when I go to these places, if I don't feel passion, I can't write about it. And that's when I wrote a piece called Compassion Fatigue. Because I realized that the public was watching images constantly of um, a Bosnia, of Rwanda, and of dead children, of soldiers trying to stop killing, and that it was too much for them. And at some point, the brain just shifts and stops. And someone at the BBC actually wrote, Nick Gowing, um, wrote a paper called Compassion Fatigue about this. But I realized that I, as a reporter, was now suffering from it, so I needed a break. Um, that's when I realized as well, and I'm going to bring this up because a Canadian journalist called John Gomeshi, who you all know about, um, there was recently a big debate in New York because the New York Review of Books published an article by him. And of course, he was sacked from his job for sexual, extreme sexual harassment, but cleared of all the charges. So in the New York Review of Books, he wrote an article which the Me Too movement was very unhappy about, and as a result, to make a long story short, the editor who published John Gomeshi's story was fired. Now, I, I had a reaction to that, because I believe that we have to talk to all kinds of people when you're covering war, or I'm gonna use my example of covering war. I have to talk to war criminals. 
I have to, even if, I, even if they make me sick to my stomach, even if I hate them, even if I despise them. I need to understand what they did, and I need to hear their side of the story. So in a sense, the John Gomeshi case for me brought back this, this sense of talking to war criminals in Bosnia, in Iraq, talking to killers or rapists or ISIS commanders, horrible people, but we need to listen to them. And Susan mentioned earlier about being a good listener. This is the most crucial thing of being a journalist in any context. To listen to people is the most important thing you can possibly do. And it's something I learned how to do. It took me years. I've been a reporter now for 30 years, so it's taken a long time. From Rwanda, um, I basically went all over Africa, Somalia, Benin, South Africa, Zimbabwe. Um, my technique was, was not very sophisticated, and because I'm a print journalist and I was often freelance, I work alone. So I did not have the luxury of um, a film crew, a producer, um, someone who was with me carrying the water and the supplies. And actually, the CBC was always incredibly kind to me. They always gave me rides in their armored car, and they always gave me a cup of tea and food. And um, everywhere I went, I'd either look for the BBC or the CBC. They let me use their satellite phone. Um, but really, what I was trying to do was to embed with people and to listen to them and to watch how they worked. I'm going to tell you two more stories, anecdotes, about my work, because I think they really demonstrate um, context of wars and what war is and how it's fought. Uh, in 1999, I went to Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone um, was a country with enormous resources, diamonds mainly, but being cannibalized by greedy, evil people who were willing to sacrifice their own population for their, for their own good. And um, it was one of the most horrible wars I've ever seen because it really blurred combatants and civilians, and the civilians suffered tremendously. It was a war that was characterized by amputation, and literally the RUF, the rebel soldiers, would cut off civilians for no reason at all. Um, they'd say, do you want long sleeves or short sleeves? And then they'd either cut off your hands here or here. I held six-month-old babies who were amputated, children, teachers, doctors, anyone they could get their hands on because it would be a grotesque reminder of their power. And it was a way of instilling fear into the population. It was a horrible, horrible war. Um, in 2000, I was alone. There weren't many reporters there. I often worked in places because I was freelance where other reporters didn't really want to go because that was where I could get a story. Um, and I went and I was working very specifically on a project on a hospital with amputee children. When the war broke out, uh, there was a big push by the rebels to take the capital, Freetown, and they were surrounding it, and they were going to enter, and the, the people were terrified. They were going to be slaughtered. Suddenly, um, a group of 800 British soldiers arrived, special forces, led by a man called, he was then a lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant General David Richards. And I had met him earlier in East Timor, but nine months before, during a referendum, when again, he had landed with this small group of soldiers, they secured the airport, they did an incredible job, and, and they left. But in Sierra Leone, they were sent with one specific mandate, which was to just evacuate British civilians and to go home. But instead, they went rogue, and they ignored all the calls from Whitehall in London. They secured the airport within 48 hours, they pushed back the rebels, and they basically ended the war, more or less. It was extraordinary. They did not have a mandate to do it, and David Richards just decided, I am a soldier, and my job is to save lives. And that's what they did. And it was one of, in my entire career, I've never seen anything like it. Now, it had a good ending, which is that Sierra Leone, from one of the most brutal wars I've ever seen, ended in a good way. 
And I'm very fascinated by how wars end. Bosnia ended badly, and it will come back to haunt us. And it is now, in fact. There's more and more nationalism. The Russians are getting involved there. It's not going to have a happy ending. Sierra Leone, because of David Richards and his men, very quickly disarmed. Um, he was given the task of training the Sierra Leonean army. And it, it basically settled into a peace and also a reconciliation of the crimes. Um, they established a Truth and Reconciliation Committee. They set up a war crimes tribunal. And in my experience, people who have suffered horribly want justice. They want to know that the people that killed their children or burned their mothers or did horrific things, raped their sisters, I've seen everything, um, would be punished someday or would at least go to trial. That's all people want, justice. And, and that happened in Sierra Leone. So it's one of the few places I've ever worked where I feel now, looking back on that 20-some years later, that um, what that it was a humanitarian intervention that, that was successful. David Richards was actually, instead of being sacked from his job for insubordinates, went back and Tony Blair, um, who was, you know, what happened to you? He, he ended up eventually running, basically running all of the NATO troops in Afghanistan. And he did an extraordinary job. Um, he's now General Sir David Richards. And then he became chief of all of the British uh, land forces. The other war that I covered, which was horrific, was Chechnya. And I recently went to a play about one of my colleagues from Chechnya, Anna Politskaeva, who was assassinated by Putin. Well, not by him, but by one of his thugs, um, because she, as a Russian, kept going and reporting the war crimes that Russian soldiers were perpetuating against Chechen civilians. Um, that was probably the most dangerous war I've ever covered because Russian bombardment was, someone warned me before I went, it will drive you to the point of madness, and it very nearly did. Also, I was myself a German reporter and a um, French woman were the only foreigners in the entire country because it was closed, no one could get a visa. I, I, I walked in through the mountains of Ingushetia. I didn't have a visa, I didn't have the right to be there. Um, I've been banned from Russia ever since. But what I was able to do was to document and gather evidence of what the Russian army was doing, which was appalling. Um, but one thing that did happen to me there, which taught me a lesson about responsibility, was that I was in a tiny village after Grozny fell called Shamaski, where there had been a massacre. Russian soldiers had gone in, and basically they were very high on a, a drug, an injectable drug. Um, and they, they massacred an, almost the entire village. So I was trying to gather information of the, from the few survivors that were there. And I saw a Russian plane go overhead and I, I had to call my office back in London on my satellite phone, and um, I had to make a quick call. And I, I called them, and the local guy was, with, was screaming at me to get off the phone because they could lock on to your signal on a satellite phone. And my editor in London wouldn't let me get off the phone, and I was like, I have to hang up, I have to hang up. I hung up, and literally within five minutes, the, the uh, building next to me was bomb by a massive bomb, and there were eight people killed. And I will never know. Um, I've spoken to a lot of experts about it who said, no, it couldn't, they couldn't possibly have locked onto your signal that quickly, that there's no way. It wasn't your fault. It wasn't your fault. But it really taught me something, which was that we go into these wars, and we take something from these people, but they stay behind and live. And I could leave. Well, actually, in the case of Chechnya, I couldn't, because I couldn't get out. I was trapped inside there. But as Westerner, as someone with privilege, as someone with the, the white flag of being a reporter, I was kind of untouchable. And that we have to always remember what we're doing to the people that we're, we think we're helping. Um, and it was a very, very painful lesson for me, but an important one. After Chechnya was 9-11, and that's when, for me, wars changed completely. And in fact, I divide my life between pre-9-11 wars and post-9-11. 
Afghanistan and Iraq meant for me a new kind of journalism, which I didn't really understand at first, which was Twitter, blogging, um, Vice News, things that, which is started by a Canadian, by the way, two Canadians. Um, it's it, also this concept of embedding with soldiers, which I is, you know, I'm not judging anyone, but it's certainly not for me because it means that you report what they want you to report, which largely is their military operations and not civilians, which is what I want to write about. Um, and Iraq went so horribly wrong. I was sent to open an office of the Times of London in Baghdad during the time of Saddam. So I had the luxury of having two or three months before the invasion to kind of really hang out in Baghdad, talk to people, understand what was going on. Um, and no one wanted an occupation. They hated Saddam. They were terrified of Saddam. People were so paranoid. It was the most paranoid place. No, Syria. Syria is paranoid. Um, but they didn't want any, they didn't want a foreign occupation. They wanted to get rid of Saddam by themselves. And the resulting chaos and the unraveling of that country has led, in my mind, to all of the dysfunction in the Middle East today. It's really at the core of it. When you talk to young, radicalized Muslim guys, it's always Iraq that comes up in their, in their narrative. It's always what happened in Iraq and the kind of anger of, of how wrong that went. Um, and also, and Palestine, that's the other thing. They always, you know, in, until the Palestinian question is sorted out, there will be no peace in the Middle East. Because again, talking to radicalized young men, they always say, look at, it, look at what is happening to our brothers in the West supports the actions against them. The Arab Spring was an extraordinary thing to report. There was so much passion and so much, it was really amazing. It was a, it was a movement of young people. It was people power um, and it was fueled by social media. So to see Twitter and Facebook bring, bring together these huge crowds in Tahir Square in Egypt, in Libya, in Tunisia was really, really extraordinary. And I still feel, I really do feel that it was not, people say they call it the, the Arab winter, that it was a failure. To me, it was not. Democracy, or in this case, sometimes democracy is not what people are looking for, but in the case of many of these people, it was about having the rights that we take for granted every day, to vote for your own leader, to have freedom of expression, to be able to open a newspaper and genuinely believe that it's coming from a reporter and not from the state, to have television channels you could, you could listen to, to have rule of law, to have governments that are not riddled with corruption beyond belief. That's all they wanted. So I think um, Tunisia, of all, of all the Arab Spring countries, has been a good example. And there's been some hiccups there, but it's really, it's really on a track to something, to something good. Um, Libya, terrible problems, but that was more for me, what happened in Libya was that if you have a dictatorship for 40 years and then you dismantle it completely, there's no institutions. I mean, the Libyan people had no court system, they had no, journal, no journalism, they had no, I mean, there were, of course there were lawyers, but it was all under Gaddafi's reign. Um, so you can't really expect to do a partial humanitarian intervention, which is what France and the UK and the US, and I think Canada was involved in that. They, um, and then pull out quickly and leave the Libyan people who have no idea how to, um, how to build a nation, leave them alone. So immediately the anarchy that fell, or befell that country has continued. And then Syria. Syria, is the most painful, heartbreaking, difficult story I have ever covered. And as I stand here, it's been seven years, eight, almost eight. Eight years is the, the age of a child in grammar school. So it's the lifetime of someone. It's, it means that for eight years, people have been enduring the most horrific kind of war. I worked as a reporter in Syria until the Assad regime threw me out of the Damascus side for reporting a massacre in Darea. 
And then I started crossing over to the opposition side, which you saw, which was illegal. Two of the reporters you saw in that film, Steve Sutloff and Jim Foley, were captured by the Islamic State in 2014 and beheaded. So my son's horrible fear that I would have my head cut off by a sword didn't come from nowhere. They both died like that for no reason at all other than that they were reporters. So Syria was the first time where really reporters were kidnapped, were beheaded, were killed. And this is a new thing that we were always shot at. In Bosnia, you know, there was a price tag on our head by, by the Serbs, 50 Deutschmarks, which isn't very much, so it was kind of insulting. But we, um, we have 50 Deutschmarks to kill a journalist. Now it's you're kidnapped, and if your country doesn't pay for you, which Canada does not pay, the UK does not pay, and the US does not pay. Other countries, France, Spain, Italy, do pay. So what happens is the Islamic State or other radical groups will kidnap journalists, aid workers, and demand a ransom. The French will be released, the Spanish will be released, and you'll have, at the end of the day, the Americans sitting in a cell, and they'll kill them. And it's a really horrible thing that we need to work out a policy of what we're going to do in the future because, in my view, the Islamic State are not going away. Um, they've, Raqqa has been bombed, um, but they're regrouping, and I think something else they they will something else will happen because you cannot you can't stop an ideology, and what. ISIS did was it gave a kind of opening to all these young disenfranchised Muslim guys living in Europe. I lived in France for 15 years and it is true that they were very disenfranchised and separated from society, um, isolated, alienated, not given jobs, not given education. Same in the UK. Germany, less or so. Angela Merkel was a beacon of civility. Um, and their call by these radical groups was so strong because it offered them a chance to be somebody and to have a future, even if that future meant blowing yourself up. I think um, time is running out, so we're gonna move to the Q&A, but I just wanna end this with something that last night, having listened to Peter's beautiful voice in his 1945 reports, I was thinking about coming home to the US, my place of birth, and like so many Canadians, um, you know, my country had been a country of immigrants, and that's what made it wonderful. Um, my dad loved America because he felt that it was a place where you could invent yourself, and you could go for opportunities and chances, and that it was a country that welcomed people like him. His family was escaping from fascism, from Mussolini. My grandfather was a very, very small town um, mayor. And he, he left because he was, he was persecuted, but they also left because of poverty. And they, they sought a, a new chance. And it, it breaks my heart that I'm living in a country where we have a president who calls people who are trying to flee their countries because of poverty or persecution or radical human rights abuse and calls them rapists and murderers and you know they're a caravan that's going to invade us. So painful for me to see my country divided by bigotry and hatred. It's a level that doesn't, didn't exist when I left 30 years ago. But I believe there are too many good people in America to let war happen. And I think by now if I'm an expert at anything, I'm an expert at seeing how wars start. And one thing I do know, it, it happens so quickly. When I was living in the Ivory Coast, my husband and I went there because we wanted a place where there was no war, where it was peaceful, where we could live and I could write my book and we could have a baby and we could have a wonderful life. And one night, he went to do a story. He's, he's a cameraman. And um, I was alone in the house and I heard gunshots in my garden. And I thought, oh God, I've got PTSD. <laughs> what is this? But I didn't. I crawled over to the window and I saw tracer rounds in the sky and then I saw a child soldier running across my garden with an AK-47. And within a day, the Ivory Coast had descended into a 
a bloody West African civil war. It happens so fast, and all the places I've been, it's the same. It's like one day you're living your life, you're meeting friends for a beer, you're going to work, and then it's, it's like a curtain goes down, and <laughs> no money comes out of the machine when you put your card in, the electricity is cut, you turn on the TV and it's fuzzy, even your radio goes down, then the borders close and you're trapped. I think I've, been, I've seen too many wars now because I, this scenario runs through my head a lot and I always have plans, where am I gonna go and where's my passport? And, um, but I believe there's too many good people in America to let that happen, although the gun control does scare me and the rise of militias and anti-Semitism and racism and the immigration issue. Um, but I wanna end this with a quote by Peter Sturzberg, which I found among his many notes in the CBC archives. He said, he was talking about a book he was writing. This is an example of the limitations of oral history. You can't get a person to say what he or she doesn't wanna say. It doesn't matter. Much as far as political oral history is concerned, but if you interview enough people, the truth will always come out. So I'll end that on this. Thank you.